Hello. Today I'm going to talk about the basic rules of thermodynamics. Um, these rules or laws is a, a way we talk about them are not the kind of laws that we're used to dealing with in everyday life. Um, if you want to drive 40 miles an hour down Sheridan Road, you can. Uh, the police will stop you and they'll tell you you're in violation of some law, some speed law. The laws of thermodynamics, though, the laws of physics, are laws that you can't break no matter how hard you try. Um, if someone gives you an example where they appear to have violated one of these laws, uh, one of the things that we physics people will do is look very carefully at what you're talking about, what you're doing, and say, ah, uh, here's the mistake you made in interpreting what you think you were doing. Um, or here's the way in which what you're looking at uh, is just a piece of a system where in the bigger system, the whole universe, that law is still uh, holding true. So I'll give you some examples of that. But uh, uh, the idea of law is uh, equivalent to the idea of the way the universe is constructed. Um, if you could imagine breaking one of these laws, then you're imagining a different universe, uh, a different world, not the world that we actually inhabit. Um, and so by understanding these rules, these laws, we know something more about the world we live in. Um, more important, if you really do understand the laws of thermodynamics, you'll know some things that uh, are possible, we just need to work and figure out how to do it, and other things that are simply impossible. There's no way to construct a machine that uh, uh, runs itself forever. There's no perpetual motion machine. There's no way, as we'll see, to get free energy uh, without using energy from some other source. Um, so uh, we can learn not just what's possible, but also what's not possible. And we can avoid pursuing some ideas or things or opportunities uh, that uh, are really not going to be fruitful in the, uh, in the long run. All right, so here we go. Um, the most uh, fundamental law, so most physicists will talk about the first and second law of thermodynamics, but uh, Mr. Muller introduces uh, what he calls the zeroth law of thermodynamics, the most basic principle uh, that ties all the other principles in thermodynamics together. And that's uh, the idea of, uh, of temperature, just that it exists. That, as we saw uh, earlier, it's the measure of the kinetic energy of the molecules in a system with respect to each other, or atoms. Um, but what we also saw is that the change in temperature, there's two objects at different temperatures, if you bring them in contact with each other, if you let them interact, eventually they're going to be the same temperature. And the way heat flows is it'll flow from the thing that's at a higher temperature to the thing that's at a lower temperature. Um, and so this uh, means that if you introduce something like cool something down, it's a very tricky process. You need to find some way to extract heat from a thing that's already colder than its surroundings. Um, and so it might seem like you're violating this rule, but we'll see later on how, uh, at least that idea, uh, in the big system you are, you're not violating the rule. In the small system, you can skirt around some of these little, little bits of rules. All right. The, uh, the traditional first law of thermodynamics just says that energy in a, uh, an entire system is going to be conserved. There's, uh, uh, there's no free energy. There's no way to create an energy out of nothing. Energy can be transferred from one form to another form, but the amount of energy in the system is always going to be the same. Now, that system might be much bigger than you're imagining. For example, when uh, uh, we look at uh, the energy in food, uh, as we saw before, that energy really comes from the sun. And even the energy on the side of the sun comes from the arrangement of uh, protons and uh, uh, neutrons inside the sun at the core or at the heart of the sun where certain processes are happening that release that energy and eventually comes to us as, uh, as heat and light. Um, but this idea, it kind of makes sense. It's a, um, a rule that I think uh, is not a shock to people. Um, it uh, uh, reflects actually, in fact, a kind of symmetry of the universe that I'll talk about later on. Um, but it's still... Uh, is a funny thing to think about uh, when we compare what we say in the physics world to what we say in the regular people world. Uh, for example, uh, you've been told to conserve energy, and when physicists hear that, we kind of snicker because energy is always conserved. But what we mean by that is this uh, phrase in green here that says what we want to conserve is useful forms of energy. Uh, this is mentioned in chapter one of uh, the text, and I think in one of the one of the essay questions. What we mean by that is that uh, not all forms of energy are equally useful. What we're going to do is take the energy in whatever form it is and then turn it into something that's useful to us. Um, it might be to heat our homes. It might be to cool our homes. It might be to run an engine. And that's uh, usually the way that uh, physicists think about this. Um, so uh, what we really want to conserve are useful forms of energy, forms of energy that are easily converted into heat uh, or easily that we can easily draw energy from uh, with a high rate of power so that we can convert that energy into useful work uh, at a very high rate. Uh, very quickly. 
Um, so those kinds of energy, those forms of energy, uh, we're all familiar with uh, oil, gas, coal, even wood if you're in a campsite, um, gasoline if you're going to drive a car, and, uh, and so on. Uh, those forms of energy are either limited in their amounts uh, in our environment, our world, or they're expensive to create. Uh, expensive to put together uh, in terms of the energy that goes into it, but also time and effort and, uh, and, uh, and, and the kind of useful work that we might do. So we want to conserve those forms of energy. This is why uh, your dad tells you to shut the door if you walk outside with the air conditioning on, uh, why your dad might go through and turn the lights off in the house if people aren't in the room, uh, why uh, you might uh, turn the oven off after you've taken the food out of the oven or shut the refrigerator door after you've gotten the things you need outside of the refrigerator. Um, all these things that we talk about conserving energy are really about conserving the useful forms of energy, the forms of energy that are easily converted from uh, one form into a form that we, we want to have, like uh, electricity or the motion of our car or things like that. All right. The more strange idea, the more complicated idea, the more fun idea is this concept of entropy. And uh, entropy is one of these subjects that when a physics student gets to it, uh, we finally realize that uh, physics is not all fun and games. It's not, it's actually, it's hard. Uh, it involves hard math. There's some funny math involved behind uh, entropy, but basically what it's trying to do is think about the number of ways in which energy could be distributed in a system and to count all those possible ways. And then to recognize that many of those different ways look indistinguishable uh, for an observer, can't see the what we call the microstate, uh, they look the same to us out in the real world, in the world of experience, of uh, personal experience. So, for example, um, if uh, you know the temperature inside the room is uh, 78 degrees, um, you know the average kinetic energy of all the molecules in that room. Um, there's a lot of different ways those energies could be distributed amongst the molecules in the room and still give you a temperature 78 degrees. Um, there's many more ways for the energy to be distributed if the temperature is 95 degrees. And many fewer ways if the energy, that the energy in the room can be distributed if the temperature is only, say, 22 or 21 degrees or something much smaller. So entropy is a measure, a quantitative measure of the disorder, the spread outedness of uh, the energy in a system um, and uh, how unusual a particular arrangement might be compared to the other arrangements which give uh, the same kind of uh, uh, results, at least at the macroscopic level. So the claim we have is that entropy in a system always increases. This means that the energy, the way the energy is distributed in a system, <clears throat> is always going to become more and more random, uh, more and more spread out, <clears throat> if you will, above all the possible, among all the possible molecules, um, possible pieces uh, inside that system. Um, some consequence of this is that there's no such thing as free energy. There's no way to uh, even convert energy from one form to another uh, into a form that you want with complete uh, perfect uh, uh, precision, you might say. Um, there's no perfect heat engine. There's no way to take uh, heat and convert that to work and make sure that all the energy of the heat is converted to useful work. There's simply no way to do that except under imaginary kind of conditions. And then finally, um, it always takes more energy than you think or calculate to make a result really happen um, if you don't account for the fact that entropy is going to increase. So, for example, in charging of a battery, you're converting energy from usually electricity, putting it back into the battery storage for later. But what happens is some of that energy is going to be lost, um, usually as heat, uh, as uh, destruction of the chemicals inside the battery, and, uh, and so on. So there's no perfect efficiency in the world. Um, we're always becoming, we're always losing something, usually to heat, uh, that energy is being spread out throughout the universe in some way that's not necessarily the way we might, uh, <clears throat> we might intend. Um, even if you think about uh, heat, where you're just burning a piece of coal, uh, some of that energy goes in places you don't want. There's no way to direct all that heat. Uh, direct to the person you want to you want to heat up. If you don't think of it that way, the things around are going to get heated up as uh, as well. So uh, as far as entropy goes, uh, there's some kind of canonical or fun examples that people always talk about. I put those over here. Um, and uh, the first one, the one that's traditional when physicists talk to each other, is just to think about uh, your desk or your room. Um, over time, it just gets, gets messier and messier and messier, and then uh, it becomes such a mess that you can't find anything, or you kind of have some idea of where things might be, but to, to go through layers of papers to, to find it. Um, that's an example of the order, the room becoming more and more disordered. Um, if you put energy into putting things back where they belong and uh, putting your inbox here and your outbox there and your things to do over here and the things you don't need to do over there, um, then there's a, a very small number of ways to arrange those, uh, those, number, those possible things. 
if it's a mess, it's because the there are many different arrangements of, of particular things that look kind of the same, that look equally messy uh, or equally cluttered. Um, so that's a, you know, a way that uh, physicists picture this, usually because we have very messy desks and very messy offices. Um, an example is just a deck of cards. Um, if you get a fresh deck of cards, the cards are all in order, uh, you know, ace through king, uh, you know, the spades and clubs and hearts and diamonds and so forth. Uh, there's a particular way that a deck of cards is ordered. Once you shuffle it, uh, the cards become to us disordered. Now, if you count it a different way and measured your colors in a different way, any particular ordering is equally likely. Um, but there are a lot of orderings that look to us kind of the same. They're just, uh, there's no way to predict from one card what the next card is going to be. If you're playing cards and you have, say, a three of a kind, you know, that's an unusual arrangement. Um, and if you're playing with just one of the two other people, that's probably the most unusual arrangement, an arrangement that's going to win you the poker hand if you're a person who plays poker. Um, if you're playing with 10 or 12 or 15 other people, that three of a kind might not be the best possible arrangement, might not be the most unusual arrangement out of that large number of people. So uh, a person who's good at uh, statistics can uh, look at uh, a particular hand of cards and uh, do some calculations and figure out what, uh, what the likelihood is that that hand is going to be a winning hand, uh, even knowing nothing about what the other players at the card table are doing. Um, so another example of this is, is uh, hopefully less uh, in your experience is the collision between a car and, say, a brick wall. Um, before the collision, the car looks like a car and the brick wall looks like a wall. After the collision, the bricks will be all scattered and the car is going to be all well, broken in some ways. Um, that energy that used to be in just the motion of the car has now been converted into uh, kind of the crushing energy of the, uh, of the car itself. It acts like a spring. Um, the crumbling of the bricks, uh, the noise is a very small amount of the, uh, of the energy in the system, but it does carry away a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of energy. Um, and hopefully not the crushing of the passengers and the, and the driver inside the car. Um, most of the energy collision goes into the rearrangement of the molecules of the car itself, that, that crushing of the car. Um, there's only one way, or you know, you can think of very few ways to have a nice looking car. There's lots of ways to have a broken car. Um, and so that's another example, a nice example of how entropy really works in the uh, real world or world of experience. Um, chemistry is all about entropy. Um, if you let a chemical system go, uh, what happens is the energy gets spread out in more and more complicated ways, more different ways. Um, it's unusual to uh, the molecules break down. Uh, the kind of molecules that are formed uh, take advantage of the fact that entropy is always going to increase. Chemists have very special ways of uh, talking about this and quantifying it. Uh, that tells them whether a reaction, for example, is going to be releasing energy uh, to the environment or absorbing energy from the environment. Um, biology is another example of this. Now, biology, in many ways, seems to or appears to violate uh, the idea of entropy because if you have a biological system, what it does is take in uh, simple carbohydrates, for, for example, and convert them eventually with some other materials into very complicated organic molecules. Um, but this process takes an enormous amount of energy and if you account for all the energy that goes into that process, the heat from the sun, uh, the nuclear fusion that happens in the core of the sun, whatever produces that energy that produces the carbohydrates that produce the molecules, it turns out that uh, the amount of entropy in the rest of the world is increasing by a lot, even if locally inside that cell, the entropy is decreasing. And so biology is kind of a fun example where we have to really think of the, of the huge system involved uh, to create uh, a simple organic molecule, like a protein or something like that. Um, and then finally, uh, probably the most visually simple way to see this is with a pool table. Um, if you look at a pool table and there's uh, all the pool balls are in their little triangle and arranged nicely, you know it's the beginning of the game. Uh, once the pool balls are scattered uh, by the first shot, uh, you can see they're all over the table. But some are moving, maybe, and some are not. Uh, and some will fall into a hole or who knows what. Um, you can see there's a lot of ways to arrange the energy, which is all concentrated at one point just in the pool ball, the cue ball moving towards that, uh, that rack of, uh, of lined up billiards balls. So these examples are just uh, illustrations that entropy, the disorder of the world, if you want to call it that, uh, which is fair, is always going to increase. It's always going to get more and more spread around. Uh, the energy will be always more spread about among different things. Um, even if locally that doesn't happen, it happens in the big picture in a bigger way. All right. So let's going to talk about another example of entropy in a way is uh, the idea of boiling water. Um, what you're doing is putting heat into uh, the system, the boiling water system. Uh, if you're boiling the water, the temperature actually doesn't change. 
the heat goes into the water and uh, produces steam. And the steam of the water, the steam form of water, uh, has more entropy. There's more ways for it to move around, more ways for it to be spread around than the uh, temperature of the water molecules itself when the water is in a liquid form. The reverse process, condensation, um, so, so steaming, uh, heating something, keeps the temperature from changing. It actually uh, turns the heat into steam. Uh, condensation is almost the opposite process. Um, so if you have a, a condensing thing, like a cold glass of water with ice in it, um, you'll notice over time that <clears throat> droplets of water form on the glass. That's the, <clears throat> the water vapor from the air condensing on that glass. And that condensation process actually heats up the glass. Um, a condenser in a, a HVAC unit uh, draws moisture out of the air. Um, it heats up the condenser and uh, cools off the, uh, the air. So these, uh, these processes are, uh, you might think of them as purely theoretical things, but they really have practical applications in the, uh, in the real world. And that's, uh, that, those connections are things I want, you to help, I want to help you appreciate as you go through this, uh, this class and think about the real world, the world we all uh, share and live in. All right, thanks.